Wisdom is one of the things everybody pursues. Everybody wants to be wise. Unfortunately, all too often, uh, people wait till it's too late to be wise. Uh, after the mistake has been made, you know, everybody gets smart at that point. Uh, I think uh, what we need to think about is, is to learn Solomon's lesson. I mean, what he wanted to teach his, his students was how important it was to be wise before you make the mistake rather than after. And what we want to talk about tonight is uh, just the opportunity we have to read God's Word and, and experience along with the body of Christ and, and talk to people and mentors and friends and people who love us and learn from their mistakes and learn from their wisdom so we don't have to go out and make every mistake ourselves. We're able to be wise uh, before we mess things up. And uh, the, the true wisdom can only happen before something bad happens, not after. So uh, we're able to be wise if we can rely on other people's wisdom, rely on their experience as well as our own, to be able to uh, make wise choices and, and just be wise in our approach to the world. Our scripture reading for this evening is going to come from uh, the book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verses 20 to 33. Wisdom shouts in the streets. She cries out in the public square. She calls to the crowds along the main street to those gathered in front of the city gate. How long, you simpletons, will you insist on being simple-minded? How long will you mockers relish your mocking? How long will you fools hate knowledge? Come and listen to my counsel. I'll share my heart with you and make you wise. I called you so often, but you wouldn't come. I reached out to you, but you paid no attention. You ignored my advice and rejected the correction I offered. So I will laugh when you are in trouble. I will mock you when disaster overtakes you, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster engulfs you like a cyclone, and anguish and distress overwhelm you. When they cry for help, I will not answer. Though they anxiously search for me, they will not find me. For they hated knowledge and chose not to fear the Lord. They rejected my advice and paid no attention when I corrected them. Therefore, they must eat the bitter fruit of living their own way, choking on their own schemes. For simpletons turn away from me to death. Fools are destroyed by their own complacency. But all who listen to me will live in peace, untroubled by fear of harm. Here is the reading. As, uh, as most of you know, I uh, graduated from Ohio Northern University. And during the four years I spent there, i got to be honest with you. I didn't fit into the college crowd very well. In fact, not at all. Most of the reason was because I didn't drink, which cut me out of about 95% of everything that wasn't in class while I was there. All I did in college, and this is honestly, this is all I did. I went to class, I worked, I worked out at Kinghorn Center, and I ran laps around the Green Monster. Those of you who are familiar with the Green Monster, ONU. and uh, That was it. And to be honest, there wasn't much about the uh, college life that really appealed to me in any way. And it didn't help that while I was there, I was a religion major at ONU. So I spent a lot of time around the philosophy students. And people who spend a lot of time in the philosophy department, well, they're a little different. <laughs> and uh, since I didn't fit in any place else on campus, I spent a whole lot of time in the philosophy and religion department. And I occasionally got roped into these very deep theological discussions. And I tell you, there were a few times when I would get caught up in one of these uh, philosophy student arguments that would happen. And I would get caught up in these things, and they would be talking about something like, I've got to read this off my page. They'd be talking about something like the hermeneutical implications of classic literature from the ancient Near East. And they'd be fighting about that, and I would be in the midst of a discussion thinking, you know, my lifelong stance against alcohol use of any kind may not have been that great of an idea. <laughs> At that point, I could have used some help. But if you remember one particular day, the nerd squad caught me while I was walking by the lounge in the philosophy department because, you know, that's where all the cool kids hang out, is in the lounge of the philosophy department. And they wrote me in by a question. And the only reason I engaged in the discussion is the question made me mad. I didn't agree with what they were deciding. They had decided in their little discussion group that experience is the best teacher. And, man, I went off the wall on them because I... I didn't agree with them. In fact, I, they, they had already convinced themselves that when I came in, they didn't agree, and we got in a fight. I fought so hard that they really dropped their pocket protectors. I mean, we were getting serious about this because they had decided that experience was the best teacher. And while I might agree that experience might be the most effective teacher, experience is not the best teacher. Now, at that time uh, in my career at Ohio Northern, I was a youth minister. I was working at Emmanuel Church, which is over in Elida. And I had a youth group in my I had a youth group that I worked with. And in my overreaction to the question, I was thinking about the kids in that group. 
How many of the parents of those youth group kids I was working with, how many of those parents would want me to go back and say, hey guys, experience is the best teacher. You want to say that to a group of teenagers? How many of you parents here tonight want me to go to your kids and have the pastor tell them, hey guys, experience is the best teacher. Now the argument was that the lessons that we learn from experience, they stick with us the longest. That I agree with. But I still don't agree that experience is the best way to learn. My argument to them is that it's much less painful to learn from other people than to have to go learn on your own. I mean, let's, let's be honest. I don't need to fill up a trash bag with empty beer cans to know that alcohol is a parasite I don't want in my life. I don't have to stick a needle in my arm to know that drug abuse is wrong. I don't need to be abusive to other people to know that's not how I want to live my life. I don't need to experience those things because the proof is all around me. I don't need the added bonus of getting experience to know that these are dangerous activities. The best way for me to learn is to pay attention to hospital calls that I make that are alcohol related. And I can know for a fact that I don't want that in my life. And as I look at these people and I see a teenager scraped off the road and all these different things, I can look at this and say, I don't want to give my money to companies that produce things that cost this kind of stuff. And that's why I am against it. And I'll tell you, nothing breaks my heart worse than the scenario that King Solomon lays out in this passage I read to you from Proverbs. It happens time and time again. In my career, I see it all the time. People start seeking wisdom when it's too late. The time to do the wise thing has already passed. It's way behind you, and now you want to get smart do the right thing. Man, I hate it when somebody starts looking for God after some awful life experience has taught them the error of their ways. All too often, when people start looking for God, it's because they have no other place to go but up. Now, finding God before you reach the end of a destructive road, friends, that's way better than going to the end of that road and having God be the only option you have left. Now, I'm not going to deny that God can still work when you're laying at the bottom. I don't deny that. God can still do His thing. But how much better is it to find God before you go through all the pain to get to the point that God's the only one that's left? Much better. And you save yourself an immense amount of pain to find Him quicker than that. Now, if you are all familiar with the book of Proverbs, you'll know that Proverbs is a collection of sayings. It's sort of a life's instruction manual, so to speak. And there's advice on all kinds of topics in Proverbs. Some stuff that you may not realize is in the Bible, you'll find in Proverbs. And there really is no rhyme or reason to the book. It's just a collection of sayings and wise teachings and good advice that's in there for us to read. And you'll find, if you go read the chapters in Proverbs, you'll find out that the advice that's in there is as applicable today as it was a couple of thousand years ago when Solomon recorded it. Now, as I've mentioned a couple times, most of the book is written by Solomon. There's a couple things toward the end that was written by somebody else. But most of it's written, is attributed to Solomon. Now, I don't know if you knew this about Solomon. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. That probably means that Solomon had lots and lots of children. And it would be impossible for Solomon to even know all of his kids. Because if he even had one child for every ten women that he was sexually connected to, that's still a hundred kids. And chances are he had many more than that. So it's unlikely that Solomon was able to parent each child properly. So the kids were put into schools with tutors and books that they were taught how to live. And Proverbs was a part of that training. It's written down as a father speaking to a child. Here's how you go about living life. And the opening chapter of the book of Proverbs, which I read a piece to you from tonight, starts out with a poem from the perspective of wisdom. In the poem, wisdom even says that way too often, people search for wisdom after the damage is done. Once the opportunity to do the wise thing comes and goes, and the consequences start to set in, that's when everybody wants to get wise. You know, when the chance to be wise is passed, everybody wants to get wise then, because once the consequences start to set in, friends, it's too late to be smart then. Wisdom only works before you make the mistake. It doesn't help you much after. It can do very little to help you after the mistake has been made, because after the mistake, everybody's an expert. You got to use it before. And you want to know what makes this so sad? It's the fact, friends, we don't have to only learn from our own mistakes. 
You're not required to only learn from your mistakes. We don't have to make every mistake under the sun to learn all these lessons. I mean, during my time of training to become a pastor, I learned a lot of things from a lot of great pastors. But to be honest, I learned a lot more when I watched them make mistakes, when they did things wrong. I saw how they handled it when they made a mistake. And I learned why we should or shouldn't do things certain ways. And while I learned from my own fair share of mistakes, uh, I also was not afraid to learn from the mistakes of others. Because friends, that's a way less painful way to make mistakes, is to learn from somebody else's. But here's the problem, and here's why we don't do it that way very often. The problem is, there's a certain humility that comes from learning from somebody else's mistake. You see, it all depends on your attitude. And do you know, it is nothing but arrogance to watch somebody else make a mistake, or to see somebody else who's made a mistake, and think, you know, I'll just do it better than them. Now, I'm not going to make the same error, or it's not going to blow up in my face. I, now, I saw them do it. They messed it up. I'm going to try the exact same thing, but when I do it, it's going to work. Friends, that's arrogance. You have to be willing not to do certain things because of the lessons you learn from somebody else. And to not learn from somebody else is to just be bullheaded and stubborn. And you will endure a whole lot of pain if you don't allow yourself to learn from somebody else's mistakes. You see, and there's another danger of learning only from your own experience. And this is the biggest danger we face in learning from experience. And while this may, this may sound crazy at first, go with me on this and hopefully it will become clear. You see, every one of us sees an experience differently. We all see an experience very differently. An experience that you may enjoy Think it was the funnest thing you ever did. And we go back and do it in a heartbeat. I may look at that and think that was the worst thing that ever happened to me. I don't enjoy that. I don't like that. Whatever. We all see experiences very, very differently. My priorities, my interests are going to be different from yours. Therefore, my interpretation of experiences is also going to be very different from yours. What you see as a very positive experience, I might see as a very negative experience. And therefore... The lesson that we learn based on that particular experience is going to be different. Because we look at it differently because we're all different. That means it's quite possible that experience can teach you something. That your experience could possibly teach you something that's not 100% accurate. Let me explain. I've had plenty. I've had plenty of experiences in my career that would lead me to believe that I'm not a very good pastor. I've done it a whole bunch of times. I have had plenty of experiences that could have taught me that there's a lot of places that I don't belong. I've had plenty of experiences that would teach me that it's not a good idea to trust other people. And, and you've had the same experiences along the way. You know, we've all had plenty of experiences that teach us the nice guy always finishes last. Experience may have taught me these things, but just because experience taught them to you doesn't necessarily mean they're true. Allow me to give you an illustration, see if I can clear this up. This is, I, I read about this once a few years ago. There was once a woman who was very severely mentally handicapped to the point that she was unable to speak, and she spent her entire life in an institution. Now, she was very, very docile, very nice, never had any problem, but all of a sudden, one day, she began to show some violent tendencies, lashing out at the staff, lashing out at other patients, which was not in her character at all. They never had this problem before in her life. So over the weeks, the problem became worse and worse to the point that she had to be confined into a padded room and they could not figure out what the problem was. And she was in the padded room and she was dangerous. Nobody could even go in near to her. Well, finally, a doctor came to see her after many weeks and they had to go in and, and wrestle her down and sedate her and they started running tests. And you know what they found? She had an abscessed wisdom tooth that she could not tell anybody about. So the doctor did a procedure, took that out, and she was right back to her old self again. She had no way to communicate what was actually wrong. After the surgery to correct the, the abscess wisdom tooth, no problem after that. Now, nothing about the experience of this young woman would have led the staff to believe that she had a tooth problem that, and, and that was causing her to act in insane ways. I'll admit, abscessed teeth are horrible, but they aren't normally associated with insanity along the way. So the experience of the staff said she's just losing her mind. And what was actually wrong is she had a tooth that was infected. 
Again, the experience of the staff told them one thing, but reality was entirely different. It was an entirely different problem once they got in there and checked it out. Experience can be misleading sometimes. Not always, but can occasionally be misleading. But experience will always be misleading if you go into it with preconceived notions to the experience. See, we can all have factors that are floating around in our minds, things that we think, things that we believe, they have nothing to do with the experience at hand, but they can help us or force us to interpret them as a part of the experience. Because what we're doing is, is these things that are floating around in our minds, they become a lens that we look at the whole world through, and it can make everything look different. And they can teach us the wrong lesson. You see, when you find yourself drowning in doubt about the people that you have relationships with, or you find yourself believing things that may not always be true, you got to ask yourself, am I looking at the world through a distorted lens? At the lens that makes me see untrustworthiness every place I look. Makes me see anger everywhere I look. See, when you're filled with self-doubt, and you don't know if you can ever accomplish something that you set out to do, because you don't believe in yourself ever, and that's the lens that you use to look at the world, chances are you start to see that everywhere. Nothing but failure everywhere I look. So you got to ask yourself, when I get angry, am I really angry and am I yelling about this situation? <laughs> or am I just looking through an angry lens at the whole world and suddenly everything makes me mad? You need to think about that. And the reason why it is so dangerous to learn all your life lessons only through your own experience and through nobody else is you have no way to evaluate your experience. Because it's all up to you. You get to draw your own conclusions. You get to decide what lesson you learn from your experience. You might learn a lesson that you shouldn't trust other people. That nobody is trustworthy. You could learn that lesson. When the actual lesson you experience might be, you know, maybe you shouldn't loan money to other people or something like that. Those two lessons very, are, are very different. But based on the interpretation of the experience, you can learn that lesson from either one or the other. Now, friends, tonight, I don't want you to start questioning yourself. That's not what we're trying to get to here. But I do want to make sure that you have some people in your life that you trust that will help you evaluate your experiences. You need to have somebody to talk to. A spouse is good, but you shouldn't only limit yourself to just your spouse. Because if you do all of your experience interpretation by yourself, if you just, you know, you're the only one who evaluates, you never talk about it, never bounce your interpretations off somebody else, you run the risk of learning the same lesson over and over and over again by continually looking through a lens that distorts the whole world. Then suddenly everything in your life becomes a reinforcement of the same lesson you already learned because that lens makes you see everything and makes it all look the same. Friends, it is difficult, if not actually completely impossible, to attain wisdom by yourself. Even with experience, trying to squeeze out wisdom is difficult when you're only working by yourself. I strongly encourage you to find some people in your life that you trust and allow them to help you make a determination of what lesson you ought to learn based on whatever experience that you're having. Because the risk you run by figuring it all out by yourself is that you could possibly end up learning the wrong lesson. And that could be dangerous. Now, wisdom is out there. Wisdom is available to us. Solomon's teaching right here in this passage of Proverbs teaches us that. Wisdom is out there and we can have it. We can attain it. But friends, there is no wisdom in doing it all by yourself. Don't be afraid to learn a lesson from somebody else that you trust. You know, they're going to be able to help you interpret experiences possibly from a different perspective. And they may be able to help you see that you have a lens that is distorting your whole world. Making you learn lessons that have no wisdom in them at all. So friends, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to include others in your quest for wisdom. Those people that you trust, they might be the difference between making an error and attaining wisdom. And what those people who love you and the people that you ought to trust, what they do for you is they help you question the lens through what you're seeing in the world. Because your experience is going to give you a wisdom that you're going to look at the world through that lens. An outside person can help call you on that. If the lens you're looking through is causing everything to look the same, or maybe distorting things so it looks a different way, teaching you lessons you don't need to learn, somebody you trust can help you change the lens. But if your own experience and your own interpretation of your experience, if that's the only source of wisdom that you have, you run the danger at looking through the world through a lens 
that's going to distort everything to the point that you're not going to be able to get to wisdom. The world can look a whole lot different if you're looking at the world through the wrong lens. That's why experience is not always the best teacher. So friends, thank God. Thank God for the people in our lives who can help us look at the world without the lens of bad experiences. And I invite you to think about how you see the world. Give some thought to that. How do you look at the world? What lens are you looking through? Because the world can look radically different depending on what lens you use. If you're looking through the lens of hate, if you're looking through the lens of anger, if you're looking through the lens of disappointment, if you're looking through despair, friends, those lenses can really color everything that you're trying to see through. Color the whole world, make it all look different than what it actually is. And those lenses can make certain choices appear wise when they really are not wise at all. That's why we need to have other people help keep us accountable and help us take an honest look at how we see the world and make sure it's accurate because the wrong lens can make everything look bad. So friends, I want to close tonight with one final challenge. Along with the people who love you, and you've all got people who love you, I know that. Along with the people who love you, I also invite you to compare the lens through which you see the world, I invite you to compare your lens, whatever it is that colors the world, whatever makes you see the world, whatever you're looking through to see and interpret the things that are going on around you, I invite you to hold that lens up to what we learn about in God's Word. How do those two things line up? Does the lens that you're looking at the world, does it line up with what we learn in the Bible? What Jesus teaches us and all these different things, do they line up? Because if they don't, if you're allowing some other lens to color your entire world, you're going to have a really hard time attaining wisdom because everything's going to look bad or everything's going to look distorted. So friends, you go from this place out in the world, I strongly encourage you, make sure your lens is clear. In Jesus' name, amen.